get any more major than Ken when it comes to investigative journalists who have the expertise in various areas of the Middle East that Ken has. Um, and, and I think it's really, in, by ha it's by happenstance, but you talk about the confluence of events that took place this week. You know, Israel had conducted yesterday a rocket experiment, okay? Uh, one of these rockets designed to intercept a, um, I don't know, Bob, what do we say, a very dangerous missile? Yes. Okay. Possibly a nuclear warhead. And the test actually went off very well. Uh, Israel will do what it always does with regards to uh, weapons systems development uh, to continue to move forward. And of course, if you read some of the newspapers today in, in Israel, uh, particularly if you're versed in Hebrew, but you also saw it a little bit in English, of course, the question then became, well, with this successful missile intercept yesterday, this missile intercept test, is Israel now prepared to attack Iran? I don't know, did you catch some of that? And then, I, I, I saw it in the Yodan or in a couple of the other papers, okay? And, and with some of the papers in Israel, there's now this Trump, well, you know, now Netanyahu is trying to convince his ministers to go on the offensive against Iran. You know, our speaker this evening is well versed in this aspect of the Middle East, in Iran, the issues of military options, non-military options, which, I don't know, are like fingers in the dike, no? Well, you'll talk about it, you'll talk about it, okay? <laughs> when Iranian leaders declare their intent to destroy us, Jews, Israel, the United States, the question is, the question becomes, what will our reaction be? Do we hold our breaths in anticipation of retaliation? If it doesn't happen, who will then pick up the mantle so that air can be breathed on this planet? from a Jewish perspective, and I am a rabbi, so I'll speak from the Jewish perspective. Do we Jews have a right to a state? And moreover, do we have a right to exist at all? And these are all questions that arise when government officials of Iran and Iran's religious leadership express an intent to destroy. Whether you're Jewish or you're not, you may be familiar with the name Amalek from the Bible. The biblical Amalek declared an existential war against the Israelites. Is it so different than the German Amalek? And in some of the Israeli newspapers today, the Iranian Amalek. From a Jewish perspective, from a freedom perspective, the Holocaust did not begin with the outbreak of war. It did begin with Hitler's hate-filled speeches and then the Sturmer propaganda. Bush there is not the only target. There are others as well. There are other threats as well. Not just in Iran, but emanating from Iran. Agents of Iran dotting the globe. Ken Timmerman is one of really, if even there are a half dozen real true experts on the Islamic Republic of Iran in the United States today. For those who joined us this past March when we 
Scream, the movie, the, doc the documentary, Iranium. Ken was prominently featured in that film. He heads the Foundation for Democracy in Iran. And the FBI is the only group among all those with Iran-related programs that works actively and closely with the pro-freedom movement inside the country of Iran. He spends much time meeting with Iranian dissidents in Europe. He regularly briefs the U.S. intelligence community on their behalf and on their activities. And I will tell you the most interesting experience that he had, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, in my view, is that Ken spent five months in a PLO jail in Lebanon. That's an interesting story in and of itself. He was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize along with John Bolton for his work on Iran in 2006. Won the Reed Irvin Accuracy and Media Award for Investigative <coughs> Reporting this past February. Uh, afterwards, we do have some volumes, some of his books that he's brought with us, brought up with him from Washington, D.C. on sale. You can find out more about Ken's work at his website, Ken Timmerman, with two M's, by the way, T-I-M-M-E-R-M-A-N.com. Uh, also at the foundation site, Iran.org. Uh, we are thankful for our co-sponsors this evening who helped get the word out about the program, Americans for Peace and Tolerance, at Boston, <coughs> Christians and Jews United for Israel, rabbis and ministers for Israel. My friends, please give a warm welcome to my friend, Ken Timmerman. Pleasure to be with you. Can you all hear me in the back? Uh, when I was um, um, a guest of the Palestinians in 1982 in Beirut, uh, they thought my last name was spelled with one M, and I was the nephew of some guy named Jacobo Timmerman who had come from Argentina. So they were convinced I was a Zionist spy and uh, treated me accordingly. When I got out uh, of the siege of Beirut in, in Lebanon and went to Israel uh, later that year uh, and was at a military intelligence briefing for the press uh, at the Beit Akron in, in Jerusalem. I remember this <coughs> showed a photograph of the gun site uh, photograph of the sports stadium in Beirut and he uh, was answering accusations from the left wing media that Israel had engaged in indiscriminate bombing of the civilian populations, the poor Palestinians were being bombed. And he said, look, I want you to take a look at this photograph. See, here's the sports stadium, yeah? and this is where the Palestinians had their AAA artillery, right? They were trying to shoot down our aircraft, and, and they had their Katusha rockets right here inside the sports stadium. <coughs> and just about all of our bombs fell within a 100 meter radius. And here you can see all the craters. And I raised my hand, and I said, Colonel, you're right. Just about all of them fell within that 100 meter radius, but I was 50 meters away, and most of them fell on my head. Um, later on, many of my Israeli friends said, oh, you are Jacobo Timmerman's nephew or his brother or something like that, and they just ran me out of town. So uh, it hasn't done me very well, and thank you for saying that my name has two M's in it. It's absolutely true, and I have nothing to do with Jacobo Timmerman, uh, neither then nor now. Uh, and. Uh, if any of you know his story, uh, this is a man who was saved by Israel in Argentina uh, as his apartment. He was a left-wing uh, intellectual and publisher in Argentina who was about to be murdered by a right-wing death squad. And, and Mossad went in and literally got him out of his apartment 30 minutes before it was machine gunned. Brought him to Israel, he became Israeli. And within a year, I think it was, he had, maybe not a year, but it was very shortly back thereafter, uh, he became a very strong critic of the state of Israel and the right of the state of Israel to defend itself and uh, became a darling of the international left and ultimately went back to Argentina after the colonels were, were uh, kicked out. So goodbye. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about Iran tonight. I want to tell you a bit about uh, 
what's going on inside Iran, what the intentions of the Iranian leadership are as I read them. But I also want to give you a sense of what we know and what we don't know about Iran's nuclear weapons program. And I want to be very clear about a couple of things. Uh, people like me, people in the intelligence community, in the inside of government, people like me on the outside, we're all looking at scattered dots on a screen and we have to connect <coughs> those dots. Right? When the intelligence community does it, it's called a national intelligence estimate. When people like me do it, it's a report. <laughs> Some kind of report or an article or whatever. Uh, in 1992, I was uh, commissioned by Simon Wiesenthal to do a report on uh, Iran, Syria, and Libya, their weapons of mass destruction programs in 1992. And at that time, I came out and said, look, there is a pattern of evidence. If you look at what Iran is buying on the international marketplace, there's a pattern of evidence that shows that Iran has a uranium enrichment program, which is completely clandestine, which they haven't declared to anybody. <coughs> and we came out with that report, and um, it made headlines, and uh, uh, I can remember doing ABC Nightline at 5.30 in the morning in Paris, which is where I was based at the time, and they had the Iranian ambassador of the United Nations here in, in Washington, who was calling me a Zionist spy, and a, and a part of a Jewish conspiracy. Well, of course, the truth always is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, that was 1992. One of the things that I pointed out in that report was that uh, the Iranian Atomic Energy Organization announced, announced, at the end of 1986, that they were hiring a consultant, a Pakistani uh, metallurgist, a guy named A.Q. Kama, <laughs> to work for them. Nobody paid any attention to this. They actually announced this in their meeting. And the next year, they said, oh yes, we've now re-upped his contract, and he's coming to Iran to help us with uh, uranium exploration, uh, you know, uranium metallurgy, things like that. Well, we find out later on that all the things that I wrote in 1992 in that report for the Simon Wiesenthal Center were subsequently validated by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, in Vienna, but not until 2003, 11 years later. <laughs> and they discovered at that point that Iran had had a secret nuclear weapons program to enrich uranium to weapons grade for 18 years. For 18 years. And nobody in our intelligence community here in the United States or in, the, or in Europe seemed to be smart enough or uh, willing to be politically incorrect enough to say it. So that's what I do. I say things that are politically incorrect. I try to connect the dots on the outside using what we call open source intelligence, which means stuff that's not classified here in the United States, but I hope is classified in Iran. I uh, work with a lot of people from the intelligence community inside Iran who have defected. Uh, I spent many, many, probably man years of time with some of these folks, debriefing them and getting information. So I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about uh, the intentions of Iran, about the 12th Imam, about Ahmadinejad, uh, what he is planning for Israel and what he's planning for the United States. How many of you have heard about the 12th Imam in Shia Islam? Wow, this is really good. Okay. Um, okay, so then I'll go right to the story. When Ahmadinejad took over as president in 2005, he held his first cabinet meeting. And he brought everybody together in the cabinet room and he said, okay, now, our role as the new government of Iran is to hasten the return of the 12th Imam. Right? Now, remember the 12th Imam was a five-year-old child in 846 or 861, uh, when he went into minor occultation, in other words, he disappeared. And finally, in 941 AD, in the Christian era, uh, after he had been represented on earth by his relatives until they all died out, they said, okay, enough of this, he's gone. Uh, and he was believed by Ahmadinejad and many 
Iranian Shiites, among others, to be living in the bottom of a well in Jankaran, which is a suburb of Tehran. So this five-year-old boy, who is the 12th Imam, the 12th, uh, if you wish, the 12th in line of the succession to be caliph after uh, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, was living in the bottom of the well. So Ahmadinejad said, our role as a government is to hasten his return. So now what we're going to do is sign a contract. So he wrote this little contract on the paper, and he signed it, he passed it around the table, and everybody in the cabinet signed it. And finally, someone at the end said, had the audacity to, to question Ahmadinejad, and he said, Mr. President, now that we've signed this contract, what are we going to do with it? You know, it's between us and the 12th Imam. What are we going to do with this contract? He said, that's obvious, isn't it? You're going to go to Jam Karan, you're going to throw it down the well. Now, that's actually a true story. Yeah, I'm not making that up. That is a true story. That is uh, the belief system that is driving the current leadership of the Islamic Republic of Iran. They truly believe from Ahmadinejad on down, Khamenei as well, the supreme leader, that through their actions, they can bring about the return of the 12th Imam. Now, why is that important? Why should we care about this? Because when the 12th Imam returns in Shiite eschatology, he will lead a victorious Muslim army to conquer Jerusalem and to wipe out the remaining infidels on the earth. It will be an era of Islamic justice. Now, I'm sure you're going to hear a lot of politically correct people here in the United States who uh, will talk about Islamic justice. Justice in Islam is a very important con concept. We should all be, uh, should bow down and say, yes, uh, they believe in justice, justice. We believe in justice. No, they don't. No, they do not. Justice in Islam means there are no more non-Muslims left. That is Islamic justice, okay? You and I and everybody that you know, we will become Muslims or we, we will become dead. That is Islamic justice. And in fact, there's a concept in Islam which is very important, and I know that uh, Rabbi uh, Jonathan uh, has talked about this with, Kurt, with uh, Garrick Wilders, a concept called fitna. I'm sure you've heard the term. If you know about the 12th Imam, you've heard about fitna. Uh, we are all committing fitna, which is injustice, persecution. We are persecuting every true Muslim who believes in the 12th Imam, who believes in the Quran, and who believes in, the, in, the, uh, in this notion of Islamic justice because we are not Muslims. We're persecuting them because we are not Muslims. We have not accepted Islam. You got that? Yeah. Yeah. So, Islamic justice means no more Jews, no more Christians, no more Hindus, no more atheists, dead people, and Muslims. All right? Now, how do you bring about, oh, I forgot to tell you one thing, of course, the 12th Imam, he comes, he comes back at a time of devastation, world war, famine, Fantastic destruction. That's what hastens his return. So if I'm Ahmadinejad and I'm sitting in Tehran, how do I hasten the return of the 12th Imam? <laughs> Gee, me and my buddy A.Q. Come on. This is, I believe, the absolute core reason behind the development of nuclear weapons today in Iran. They're not doing this for deterrence, although I believe in the past they have. Because they, they believe that by using these weapons, they will go to paradise. Rafsanjani, who was a, a famous mullah, uh, still is, president at one point, uh, head of the parliament, he had a statement that he made in 2000 when he was asked by someone, well, could you actually envisage a nuclear exchange with the state of Israel? And he said, no. 
oh yes, this is possible. Many in the world of Islam will die. But that's okay, because Israel will be wiped off the map. Now, you cannot deter a regime that believes that its defeat in our temporal terms is its victory. They win by losing, by losing in our terms. In other words, in a nuclear weapons exchange. That is what they believe at the top of the regime. Do ordinary Iranians believe this? Some of them do, but not a lot. Not a lot. The regime is probably supported by 10% of the country, at most. Now let me tell you what really keeps me up at night. It's not Iran's nuclear weapons program. It's not Iran's support for terrorism. It's not the tens of thousands of missiles that they give into Hezbollah in Lebanon that are aimed at Israel. And by the way, I was in Israel during the 2006 war uh, when we were getting hit. We got hit then by 4,000 missiles. Now they've got tens of thousands. Haifa was a ghost town in 2006. And I was up along the Lebanese border. We can talk about that later if you wish. It's not even those missiles. It's not what's going on in Gaza. It's not their support for terrorism. It's not the Hezbollah operatives that they've infiltrated into this country. It's Iran's focus on what we call an EMP weapon, yes. yep. electromagnetic pulse. Now, I hear some of you said yes. So how many of you have heard of EMP? What an audience. My goodness gracious. You know, you, so you went schooling. I can see this. this is, uh, what do you need me here for? <laughs> so, um, electromagnetic pulse was discovered in 1962 during the Starfish Prime nuclear experiment in the atmosphere in the, in the Pacific when 900 miles away the traffic lights in Hawaii went dead couldn't figure out what was going on. And so the US Air Force, which I believe was then in charge of all these in the, of the nuclear uh, uh, test program, uh, assigned a young second lieutenant named William Graham to go investigate. He was a scientist uh, doing his military service and said, please go investigate. And he discovered that a large nuclear weapon exploded in the atmosphere would give off an electromagnetic pulse, uh, a pulse wave that was capable of having a pretty dramatic destructive effect on the electric grid and on anything made of silicon. Now, there wasn't that much made of silicon in those days. Okay, there's a lot more today. Uh, if you fast forward to 2001, the United States Congress established a commission to study the threat of EMP to the United States of America and appointed William Graham, who in the meantime had been President Reagan's science advisor and who was quite a distinguished senior scientist, as its chairman. And they issued their first report in 2004 and a second one in 2008. And here's what they concluded. If the United States is hit by an EMP weapon, now this would be a nuclear missile that is exploded, let's say, over Kansas. Right. Line of sight, it reaches the two coasts, so all the way from Los Angeles to New York. It will wipe out everything made of silicon in this country. It will destroy the national power grid. And it will take our country back to the year 1820. 1820. Yeah. You might remember some of those storms you had last winter, right, when the power went out. How many days did the power go out for you last winter? Three. Four days? Four. Four. Okay, I live in Maryland, went out for five days. I got out of Dodge after two when I went down to my kitchen and I could see my breath. <laughs> Maryland. <laughs> okay? But eventually the power went back on. After an EMP attack, the power doesn't there's nobody who comes to the rescue. Right? The posse's not coming to town. The army's not going to rescue you. FEMA is gone. The cops go home to their own families. There's no water. 
There's no power. There's no natural gas. Your cars don't work because they have electronic ignition. Your cell phones don't work because everything's fried inside of them. Uh, your regular telephone system is out. And you're going to be eating whatever you can hunt, fish, grow, or catch, and defend, and bring home from walking distance of your house. And that's it. We have enough food supply stockpiled in this country with our fantastic just-in-time delivery inventory systems to last us maybe four days, five days in your local supermarket. The supermarkets will be empty in four or five days. And after that, you're on your own. Government will collapse. Imagine the police with no radios, no cars. They're going to go home to their own families. And I've been in EMP exercises in Washington, D.C., in fact, just last month, uh, where some law enforcement folks told us that. They said, don't think that there's going to be any organized police force if this kind of thing happens to us. And the Iranians have been studying it. In 1998, the Iranians conducted a test in the Caspian Sea using a barge. And they put a Scud missile, which is a 1950s generation missile, on that barge. And they test fired it. And we kind of looked at it and said, gee, what the heck are they doing that for? That's a, that's a real waste of time. Well, no, it's not. Because if you can put a Scud missile on a barge and shoot it successfully, you can also put it in a container on a cargo ship and fire it off the coast of Boston, or off the coast of Baltimore, or off the coast of Los Angeles from the commercial shipping lines. And if you fire it off of our coast, 100 miles off of our coast, for example, first of all, you don't need an ICBM, do you? Right? You can use an old generation of missile. <coughs> and the Iranians have got much better ones than Scuds, OK? So they can have a, a, a better old generation missile on that cargo container. They don't need a very long-range missile to do it. And they have the missiles capable of doing it. And then they fire it up into the atmosphere and explode it at 200 miles overhead. Well, I forgot to tell you one thing. In the past four years, the Iranians have conducted several missile tests of their intermediate-range missiles, which have detonated at apogee, at about 200 miles over the missile test range. And the U.S. intelligence community has considered them to be failures. Oh, gee, the missile blew up in midair. Isn't that too bad? Well, normally when a missile misfires, or there's a problem with it, it blows up at launch, right? Uh, or it blows up, you know, as it's in the ascent phase, and they blow it up on purpose. It does not blow up 200 miles in the atmosphere. Those tests were successes. And they were exactly the type of missile and the type of trajectory that you would use to launch an EMP weapon. That's what keeps me up at night. The Iranians have written about this in their military technology, technology journals. They write about EMP. If you think they don't know about EMP, we don't know about EMP, but the Iranians know all about it. The Chinese know all about it. The North Koreans know all about it. And, we're not, and we are not doing anything at this point to protect us. You know, during the Cold War, and I want to open this up for questions, because I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions, especially about it, too, what's going on. But during the Cold War, we had a special type of uh, computer chip. It's called bubble memories. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this. It's kind of one of those archaic from the Cold War. Uh, but the Soviet Union was so eager to get bubble memories that they set up whole networks of technology bandits to acquire them from the United States. I did a story about this back in 1987 in France. Uh, and the bubble memories were designed for one specific thing, and that was to, dis to survive a nuclear EMP blast. So all of our uh, command and control systems were equipped with bubble memories. All of our ICBMs were equipped with bubble memories. All our military communication systems were equipped with bubble memories to survive an EMP blast. In other words, when we were still wargaming, a U.S.-Soviet 
uh, mutually assured destruction type of exchange, at least we were prepared in some ways to defend ourselves. Well, 1992 comes along and the Soviet Union disappears and is dissolved and uh, uh, we declare the peace dividend in the 1990s. And gradually, <coughs> bit by bit, by bit, by bit, all that stuff gets phased out. And none of our military equipment today <coughs> is hardened against DMP. And absolutely none of our civilian power really is hardened. And here's the real kicker, and this is what really keeps me up at night, is that we have 300 very large generators that are the backbone of the power grid, and another you know, 5,000 or so medium-sized generators. But the big ones, the big, those 300 giant transformers, $20 million, $50 million a piece, they're very expensive items. We don't, we don't even make them any longer. They're made in Germany and in South Korea. When those go down, everything goes down. The grid is down. We only have a couple, the power companies only have a couple of spares. A couple of spares, that's it. And they're not protected. They're not hardened against electromagnetic pulse. Which, by the way, can also happen from a giant solar flare. Okay, there's two flavors of electromagnetic pulse. It's not just a nuclear EMP. It can also happen from, from significant solar activity, such as we have seen about once every 75 years. The last time it happened was 85 years ago. 
assault, Satanism, I mean, all kinds of things, you know, just the horrors, the dregs of the human soul which come out uh, when there is no controlling authority. Uh, it is not something that I would like to live through. I don't think I would like my children. So this is what the Iranians are working on. This is what they are working on. When Ahmadinejad says, I can envision a world without America. Oh yes, it is possible. And it's coming, a world without America. This is what he means. This is what he means. Now, uh, tell you a couple more things about the 12th Imam, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my foundation. The um, Avenida Jad recently said, a couple months ago, he said, well now, I've been in touch with the 12th Imam. This guy's really something, He's, he, he talks to him, okay? He goes, I don't know whether he goes to the well or it's just in his dream, but he talks to the 12th Imam. He says, I've been in touch with the 12th Imam.